Unfortunately, I watched most of that debate last night. I was glad they were chewing up each other. I was glad they were chewing up Obama. But I have to tell you something, folks. There's a very, very serious problem here. What they're calling for, what they're supporting, with the media's help, would be rejected completely by the Founding Fathers. Now, what's going on here? Health care for all, health care for illegal aliens, decriminalize the border, guarantee minimum income, guarantee job. We are totally unmoored from limited government in our constitutional system. This is exactly why I'm a supporter of Convention of States in Article 5. What is this ideology? Well, I'm proud to say I told you about this in 2012 in another book called Ameritopia. These books fit together like puzzle pieces. I actually have a, a strategy in the writing of books. One fits with the other. Now what is this Ameritopia? What is utopianism? And tell me if this sounds about right. Utopianism substitutes glorious predictions and unachievable promises for knowledge, science, and reason, while laying claim to them all. Yet there's nothing new in deception disguised as hope, and nothing original in abstraction framed as progress. A heavenly society is said to be within reach if only the individual surrenders more of his liberty and his being for that general good, meaning the good as prescribed by the state. Through persuasion, deceit, and coercion, the individual must be stripped of his identity and subordinated to the state. He must abandon his own ambitions for the ambitions of the state. He must become reliant on and fearful of the state. You heard this last night and the night before. Especially threatening, therefore, are the industrious, independent, and successful for they demonstrate what's actually possible under current societal conditions. Achievement, happiness, and fulfillment. Thereby contradicting and endangering the utopian campaign against what was or is. They must either be co-opted and turned into useful contributors to or advocates for the state or neutralized through sabotage or other means. In fact, the individual's contribution to society must be downplayed dismissed or denounced unless the contribution is directed by the state and involves self-sacrifice for the utopian cause. This is why they trash everything private. The private sector. Anything and anyone who comes out of the private sector is said to be a special interest. No. They challenge this authoritarianism, utopianism. Utopianism also attempts to shape and dominate the individual. Listen carefully. By doing two things at once, it strips the individual of his uniqueness, making him indistinguishable from the multitudes that form what is commonly referred to as the masses. But it simultaneously assigns him a group identity based on race, ethnicity, age, gender, income, etc., to highlight differences within the masses. It then exacerbates old rivalries and disputes, or it incites new ones. This way it can speak to the well-being of the people, quote-unquote, as a whole, while dividing them against themselves, thereby stampeding them in one direction or another as necessary to collapse the existing society or rule over the new one. Mr. Producer, does that not define what we're going through right now? Now, where utopianism is advanced through gradualism rather than revolution, albeit steady and persistent, as in democratic societies like ours, it can deceive and disarm an unsuspecting population, which is largely content and passive. It is sold as reforming and improving the existing society's imperfections and weaknesses without imperiling its basic nature. And under these conditions, it is mostly ignored dismissed, 
or tolerated by much of the citizenry and celebrated by some. So transformation is deemed innocuous, well-intentioned, and perhaps constructive, but not a dangerous trespass on fundamental liberties. Utopianism also finds a receptive audience among the societies disenchanted, disaffected, dissatisfied, and maladjusted, who are unwilling or unable to assume responsibility for their own real or perceived conditions, but instead blame their surroundings on the system and on others. And they are lured by the false hopes and promises of utopian transformation and the criticisms of the existing society to which their connection is tentative or non-existent. Improving the malcontents' lot becomes linked to the utopian cause, and disparaging and diminishing the successful and the accomplished becomes an essential tactic. No one should be better than anyone else, regardless of the merits or value of his contributions. So by exploiting human frailties and frustrations, jealousies and inequities, a sense of meaning and self-worth is created in the malcontents, otherwise unhappy and directionless life. Simply put, equality and misery, that is, equality of result or conformity, is advanced as a just, fair, and virtuous undertaking. Liberty, therefore, is inherently immoral, except when it avails equality. My goodness. It's been seven years since I wrote this. It's a heavy book, I understand, but you're witnessing this right now in your own country, in the Democrat Party debates, and the media reporting. Equality, in this sense, is a form of radical egalitarianism that has long been the subject of grave concern by advocates of liberty. Equality is understood by the American founders is the natural right of every individual to live freely under self-government, to acquire and retain the property he creates through his own labor, and to be treated impartially before just law. And equality should not be confused with perfection, for man is also imperfect, making his application of equality, even in the most just society, imperfect. Otherwise, inequality Inequality is the natural state of man in the sense that each individual is born unique in all his human characteristics. Therefore, equality and inequality, properly comprehended, are both engines of liberty. But equality can be more transparent at surface level than liberty. It is positive as a far-off concept of human perfectibility but is also delivered in bits and pieces, or at least appears to be, in daily life. It usually takes the form of so-called material rights. You have a right to health care, you see, delivered to the individual by the state. Equality is also disguised, disguised as or confused with popular sovereignty. That is, the conflation of the people's will with egalitarian campaigns such as social justice, Environmental justice, immigrants' rights, workers' rights, etc. So in essence, then, true democracy cannot be achieved unless society is reorganized around the disparate and endless demands of disparate and endless claimants. In due course, such a society becomes chaotic and balkanized as it dissolves and crises build. And the stage is set for escalating coercion or repression. Go to conventionofstates.com, press the button, sign the petition. More importantly, get 10 of your friends to do the same. When you sign the petition, then that sends a letter to your state legislator. You go on the list in their district as a supporter. We deliver those lists to the state legislators. It means something to them.